Heartbeat of Business. I'm your host, Michael Brett, and we've got a very exciting show here today. I'm going to be talking about um, cannabis, how to raise capital as a cannabis company. I'm going to be talking about valuations and why evaluation is so important when you're raising capital, um, or evaluations are important if you're doing mergers and acquisitions for estate planning purposes, uh, to buy, to sell a business. But for today's purposes, we're going to be talking about valuation and why it's important and why you should care about it. Um, a lot of people just fi pull figures out of the air um, when it comes to valuing their business. Now, we're not talking about an appraisal. We're talking about a valuation uh, so that you, as a business owner, understand how much of the uh, equity of your business you're going to be giving away to a potential investor. We're going to be talking about the percentage and, again, the, the formula. And, again, i got to caution everybody, math has never been one of my strong suits, uh, so I'm not going to bore everybody with a lot of mathematical equations, but I am going to discuss how you establish a pre-money evaluation and a post-money evaluation, and, again, why those are important. And there's a lot of money out there for cannabis businesses. Again, whether you're trying to start a, a dispensary, whether it's a grow facility, whether you're in the distribution business, there's a lot of comp, uh, ca capital out there. You just have to figure out how to access it. Now, you have to be very careful. There, there are uh, security laws that you need to abide by when you're raising capital. I don't care if it's for cannabis, technology, or what happens to be. You just can't, uh, you know, print something up uh, like a, a business plan and go out and start soliciting money. You have to comply with security laws. And, again, we're going to cover that in this segment of the show. This show is uh, going to be focusing on the cannabis and valuations, but you, the takeaway from the show can be raising capital for any business and valuations for any business. So, but today we're going to focus in on, on the cannabis sector. You know, there. Uh, I'm going to give you some figures here. There are about 25 million privately held companies out there in America, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and about 8% of the businesses, or 2 million, fail each year. And the reason they fail, it's not so much that the business model is flawed. It's really that they're undercapitalized when they start the business, or midway through developing the business, they run out of money. Now, forget about banks. Banks don't loan money to anybody. Uh, they make real estate loans. That's about it. So if you go to your local bank and you want to get a business loan, they're going to ask you for all kinds of collateral from real estate in order to make a business loan to you. So forget about banks. And you don't need to go through all that credit and qualifying and posting collateral if you uh, go through the process that I'm going to be covering in the show, which is equity financing, using five, uh, 506C as a private placement, doing equity crowdfunding or Regulation A funding, you're going to be selling equity. You now, you can sell debt or equity under the rules we're going to be talking about here today. But again, forget about bank financing. So what I talked about earlier is 25 million companies in America about Two million are going to fail each year because they're undercapitalized. They just don't know how to go out and raise money. Most people try to use friends and family, but they, that's very limited. Most companies can raise maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars from friends and family, and then they, you know, they exhaust those possibilities. So you need to broaden your circle of potential investors, and that's what we're going to be talking about here with the cannabis uh, capital. There are so many different avenues out there. Now, equity crowdfunding was part of the JOBS Act uh, in 2012. Equity crowdfunding allows you to put together a prospectus on Form C, which you can get from the SEC or have your securities lawyer prepare for you. And, again, it's like a prospectus. So once you have the Form C put together and your legal fees for something like that, are going to be in the area of ten to twelve, fifteen thousand dollars for legal fees, and you, you can't you can't sidestep that. I don't know how many times I get phone calls from people and they say, you know, I don't want to pay any money. Well, 
there's no such thing as a free lunch. And that's the same thing with raising capital. You're going to have to pay a securities lawyer to put together the Form C in order to become effective. And then you're going to have to pay a fee to get on a crowdfunding website where you're going to post it. Now, once you've done all that, you've got to market it. Without marketing, you're going to fail. Now, why is marketing so important? Well, it brings investors to your deal. You upload your documents to the funding platform, and then you market through YouTube or through emails, social media, uh, conferences, uh, events, to direct them to the funding platform to raise capital. That's one aspect of raising capital. That works for cannabis or any other business. But, you know, when you do that, and then you can go to the next stage, which is a 506C private placement, which you can raise unlimited amount of money. But there are rules and regulations you need to follow. Now, we're not going to be, we're not giving out legal advice on this show at all. Even though I have my doctorate degree in law for 40 years, and I've been in business for almost 30 years, uh, taking companies public, raising capital, structuring deals, we're giving you generalized information. You need to consult with your own SEC attorney when it comes to putting together the correct offering documents and the correct steps to raise money. Now, once you've decided on which one of those avenues you're going to do, equity crowdfunding or a 506C private placement, it's very important that you establish a valuation. When you're going out to, uh, and talking to investors, a lot of them you know, will say, and this is an example that happened to me a couple of months ago. Somebody approached me and said, we're trying to raise a million dollars and we'll give you 10% of the company for a million dollars. And I, I looked at him and I said, wait a minute, you're telling me your company's worth $10 million? Because that's how you get a valuation. It's what the investment is and the percentage. So they're trying to tell me a startup with no revenue, no products, no market share, and a lot of other negatives is worth $10 million. And I asked him, where'd you come up with that figure that you're going to give 10% of your company away for a million dollars? They had no answer. They were just, you know, they wanted the money and they were just picking numbers out of the air. So it's very important that you have a pre-money valuation and a post-money value, valuation. Now, the words are not that complicated. Pre-money valuation means what's your, the value of your company before an investor puts money in. Post-money valuation is what's your company worth after the investor puts money in. So, it, and again, it, there's a formula for figuring that out, and, and really, and then that determines what kind of percentage you're going to give to investors. Now, I have a giveaway on this show also. I have a white paper that talks about the formula for establishing a pre-money valuation, a post-money valuation, and what percentage of the company you give to an investor for X number of dollars. So if you want to email me when the show is over, mikebrett at gmail.com. That's mikebrett, B-R-E-T-T-E, at gmail.com. I'll email you the valuation information that we're covering so you can see exactly what the formula is for establishing the value of your company. And I can't emphasize that enough. When I talk to people that are looking for money, looking to raise capital, and I mentioned valuation, it's like, look, we don't have time for that. You know, we're trying to get a widget going, a gidget. We're trying to do cannabis, open a dispensary, a uh, grow facility. We don't have time for mathematical formulas and valuations. They just don't understand how important it is. And usually the money you're raising initially is the most expensive money if you don't do your valuation because you'll end up giving too much of the company away and then when you have to do a Series A, a Series B, a Series C round of financing, you're, as the founder, you're diluting your equity ownership stake because you didn't establish a correct valuation. That's why it's important, and that's why we're covering it here on the show. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. Business Talk Radio, Mar uh, Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business. You're going to learn everything you need to know on this show and the other shows that we have here every Tuesday at 10 o'clock on OC Talk Radio because we're going to be talking about business and only business. We're going to talk about how to start a business, grow a business, take your company public, 
exit strategy, valuation, how to find investors, everything you need to know about growing your business and taking your business to a new level. That's what Business Pulse Talk Radio is all about. Now, I also have um, information on uh, raising capital, again, whether it's cannabis or hemp or whatever, but I do have, uh, and I'll send this also to you if you email me, again, mikebrett at gmail.com. We have, through one of our investment sources, uh, up to $5 million available for uh, cannabis and hemp. And that can be, again, for a dispensary. It can be for a grow facility. It can be for uh, extraction. But you need to have, there are certain requirements. You have to have at least $500,000 a year in revenue. Can't be a startup. You have to have strong management, proprietary products, and then an exit strategy. Now, what do I mean by an exit strategy? In my business, in the investment banking business, we call exit strategy either taking your company public or a sellout. You know, somebody's going to buy you out at some point in time so the investors can get their money back. So if you email me, uh, I can give you the valuation information and I can give you the information on the $5 million investment capital, which is either debt or equity. I prefer equity. Now, why? Debt means you have to pay an interest rate. Equity means you're giving up an ownership interest in the business, but you don't have to pay a monthly or quarterly payment to the investors. They get the equity, and that's what they get. If you go the debt route, you got to, you know, and if you don't have a lot of cash flow, Every month or every quarter, that interest payment is due, and you don't want to default on that. So, uh, But we do have debt and equity financing through this one uh, investment group that I've been working with. And I've taken a number of companies public um, in Canada as well as here in the U.S. that are in the cannabis business, and we've arranged uh, capital for them through some of the techniques I've been talking about here on the show. Um, I know, it's, you know, on the federal level, you know, everybody is uh, a little confused and concerned that, you know, there's, there's not a clear and decisive um, statement as to, you know, is, you know, is cannabis legal on the federal level and can we get in this? A lot of investment banks and broker dealers, private equity capital firms are staying away from it until they get some kind of clarification on the federal level. But having said that, that doesn't mean that there isn't capital out there. There are some investment banks, there are some broker dealers, a lot of them in Canada where it's federally legal in Canada. There's an established uh, investment criteria of taking companies public in Canada and raising the can you know, capital for cannabis and for hemp. So we have a lot of that information and we're gonna be having uh, a lot of experts on the show, in our succeeding shows, that are gonna be talking about this. So I've got. A, deep contacts with investment banks, broker dealers, and private equity capital that um, are interested in looking at deals. But we get back to the premise of this show, which is valuation. It's very important that you sit down with your advisors. And if you don't have an advisor, then you need to get an advisor. Now, I developed along with a partner, John Dupuy, been a business partner. Uh, we've done a lot of deals over the last 20 years. We developed our own valuation software. It's called Value Wizard, and we do valuations. We have a, an intake form that we send to clients that has a series of information that the client fills out, documents they supply. We take that information, we put it through our algorithms. We have some proprietary algorithms that, we, that analyzes a business situation that, and then ultimately comes out with evaluation. Now, we did an evaluation for a client of ours that you've heard on our show, Elite Beverage International. They have a flagship product called Tequila Commissario. We did evaluation for them using our Value Wizard software and came up with a valuation of about $137 million. Uh, and that was last year. We're in the process of revising that, which should be almost double that at this point based on what they have. Now, in, a, in some valuation companies look only to certain elements that are tangible. How much cash do you have in the bank? What kind of intellectual property do you have? 
What are your sales? And that's and maybe some real estate. And that's about where they that's where they stop when it comes to doing evaluation for your business. What we do using our value wizard software to establish evaluation is we look at all those key elements that I just mentioned, but we also look at the uh, intangible assets that you have. We have a, a, almost a 12-step program that you go through potential sales, which your installed base of sales. What kind of market share do you have? How superior is your product? What's the customer satisfaction? And, and it goes through all those algorithms to establish the valuation for your business. So you're not just pulling figures out of the air. You're not giving up too much of your company in the, in the initial stages of raising capital for your business. Very important when it comes to doing uh, a raise for cannabis, technology, almost any kind of business. Again, if you're buying and selling your company, doing mergers and acquisition, taking your company public, estate planning, you need to have a valuation for your business. And it's really critical that you have the proper valuation when you're raising capital for your business because you're not just going to be raising a seed round. That's your initial money. You're going to have to do, uh, once you do the seed, you need to do a Series A, a Series B, a Series C, and on and on, additional rounds of financing. You can never have too much money when it comes to operating your business and executing on your business plan. So there's always different series of financing that you're going to be going through, and evaluation will help you establish along the way how much equity you give up for that capital. And like I said, if you're a founder, you don't want to be doing different uh, financings and find out that you've given away too much equity in the initial stages, and now you're down to maybe 5 or 10% equity ownership in the company as the founder, and you've given away 90% or 95% of your company to investors. That's a real good way of losing control of your business. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett. We bring you this show every Tuesday 10 a.m. Pacific time here on OC Talk Radio. And again, Business Pulse is all about business all the time. We're going to be having, um, next week I want you to tune in also because next week we're going to have a client of mine called Abtech Technology, Abtech Corp. It's a small cap publicly traded technology company in the fintech space where they have um, mobile payment technology. They have several patents on technology space, and I'm going to have Robert Sanchez on here, who's uh, the chief information officer of Aptech, talking about their stock symbol is APCX. But they're going to be on our show next. They're going to be live in studio. We're going to be doing and filming for live streaming to uh, YouTube as well. So a uh, very interesting company. They have established their valuations like I've, I've been discussing in this show. So, again, next week, um, Abtech will be on our show. Now, again, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, we do have some white papers available that if you email me at mikebrett at gmail.com, that's mikebrett, B-R-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, at gmail.com, I will email you the valuation formulas to establish the pre-money valuation, the post-money valuation, and how you can figure out the percentage that you're going to be giving to an investor for X number of dollars in capital. And I'll also email you information on an investment group that we work with that if you're trying to finance your cannabis, your hemp business, whether it's a grow facility, a lab, an extraction, B2B, B2C, uh, we can do up to $5 million dollars. But again, you can't be a startup. You have to have uh, established revenue, seasoned management, and an exit strategy. All that information will be in the email that I send to you. And it's very important. This information goes hand in hand. Valuations for your business to raise capital and sources of capital. Now, I, I get phone calls all the time from people and emails. They have a business plan. They have a pitch deck. And that's it. They don't know where to go to raise capital. Even though the SEC has, you know, with the Jobs Act and passing crowdfunding and getting flexible on advertising and market, <clears throat> marketing your offerings, <clears throat> excuse me, 
people still don't know where, where to go to find investors. It's not a secret, but it takes a lot of work. And we can help you if you tune into our shows, if you contact me directly by email, I can walk you through that process. We do a lot of road shows for clients where, where the client will come and do a presentation and we'll invite 15 to 25 investment bankers and broker dealers, private capital firms to have a lunch and have a client make a presentation. Why? The client is looking for capital. The client is a small cap company. They're looking for support in the open market for their stock. It's getting out and networking. I know everybody likes to use social media marketing and email and kind of <clears throat> kind of hide behind the scenes. You got to get out and meet people. You got to shake hands. You can only do so much over the internet and through email. And eventually, you got to talk to people face to face. People can read your business plan. They can read your private placement document. They can access SEC filings. They can get all the paper trail that they need. But investors want to know who they're dealing with. There's that trust element with the management of the company. So once you establish that, raising capital is not a guarantee, but it gets a lot easier when you're talking to investors face to face. Again, we're we're going to we're about uh, wrapping up our show here today. But again, emphasizing in this show, the takeaway is valuations for your your business, what the pre money valuation is, the post money valuation and how much equity you're giving up to investors. Number two, financing or raising capital for a cannabis company, a hemp company. We have access to that capital through some of our sources. We have white papers on a lot of this information we're talking about. So if you contact me, mikebrett at gmail.com, I will email you the white papers. And you can also call me and we can uh, have a dialogue after the shows, we can have a meeting. We can help you access capital for whatever business you might have. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in today here on Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett. Next week, tune into our show. We're going to have Robert Sanchez from Aptech Corp., small cap public company in the mobile payment sector, a fintech company, blockchain. It's a, it's a payment processing company. It's very interesting what this company has to do. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in today here at Business Pulse Talk Radio, and I'll see you on the radio next week. Thank you. You've been listening to another edition of Business Pulse Radio right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. Let's face it, not all company challenges are the same, which is why strategic market intelligence can help identify the actionable information you need to be more competitive. Gain a better understanding of your brand, competition, best prospects, or new product opportunities to generate greater revenues in 2015. Call 949-357-9547 or visit www.strategicmarketintelligence.com. Steve Kathan. Somebody's caging the children. People who oppose White House border policy are on the march today in several cities around the country. In Boston, there's criticism of government facilities for people who've crossed the border illegally. Let's not pretend it's a detention camp. These are prisons for children. Children are being in prison. The CBS News correspondent Jeff Pegues. We've seen numerous Inspector General reports which show a consistent pattern in some of these facilities, whether it's not having the resources needed to care for children or even adults. And another thing that we're seeing is this massive problem with overcrowding. A new move has been made to try to get the release of President Trump's taxes. CBS's Steve Dorsey in Washington. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Democrat Richard Neal has filed a lawsuit in federal court to obtain the president's tax returns. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin and IRS Commissioner Chuck Reddick have ignored subpoenas from the committee. 
The Trump administration says there's no legitimate purpose for which Congress is asking for the documents. Well, President Trump's plan for an Independence Day celebration in Washington will have a different look from recent years. Planes and tanks will be part of it, and CBS's Chip Reed tells us... Usually, the 4th of July fireworks on the Mall is open to everybody, and a huge number of people show up, and you sit wherever you want. But in this case, there's going to be a huge area from the Lincoln Memorial all the way halfway down the reflecting pool that is reserved for VIPs and and members of the military and friends and family of the White House. And fireworks and flyovers will stop operations at Reagan National Airport twice on the night of the 4th for just over two hours total. New information on the crash of that twin-engine plane outside Dallas that left 10 people dead. The NTSB's Bruce Landsberg says communications suggest engine trouble. Crew comment regarding a problem with the left engine occurred about eight seconds before the end of the recording. The plane crashed into a hangar and burned. On the Health Watch, researchers say they've come up with a method that effectively eliminates the virus that causes AIDS from living cells. Dr. Howard Gendelman, University of Nebraska. We never thought, even with the vaccines and the trials for so many years, that HIV could be eliminated. But today, things have changed. The procedure combines drugs and gene editing. Wall Street right now, the Dow is down 53 points. The Nasdaq is off as well. It's down about 25 points. This is CBS News. CBS News Radio, honored with the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence. Original reporting right here on CBS News Radio. These days, consuming the news is a full-time job. Will be the first real We've taste just of learned that police weather. are in the, the process US Senate of has just voted to move But with CBS News Radio's award-winning coverage, you'll never miss a story. We are expecting an incredible day on Capitol Hill. Every hour of every day, CBS News correspondents are on your radio and online, delivering comprehensive and original reporting across the country and across the world. I'm Stephen Portnoy in Singapore. This is Adrian Bard in Mexico City. This is Steve Futterman in Paradise, California. Go beyond the headlines with CBS News Radio podcasts like CBS This Morning, The Takeout with Major Garrett, and Face the Nation to listen to interviews with some of the biggest names in politics. Is this a legislative agenda or a platform for a presidential run for you? Comprehensive coverage, original reporting from CBS News Radio, on the radio and online at cbsnewsradio.com. The U.S. women play England today in the semifinals of the World Cup. CBS's Roxana Saberi. As three-time World Cup champions, confidence comes naturally to Team USA. But since beating France, the fourth-ranked team in the world last week, they're getting hit with accusations that they're more than self-assured they're arrogant. I don't think our team is arrogant at all. I think that our team is confident. Their next opponent, England, also believes it can take home the trophy. England has reached new heights with new coach Phil Neville. He's praised his opponent's ruthlessness. It's the gold medal that everybody wants, and I've got to say, America have got that ruthless streak of wanting to win. Whoever wins will compete in the final here on Sunday against either the Netherlands or Sweden. A cookbook has been returned to a library in Hawaii 47 years late. A California man says he found it in a box. He returned it when he went there on vacation. No fine. Steve Kathan, CBS News. Welcome once again to another episode of OC Spotlight, the one show taking a look at the most incredible people doing the most amazing things right here in our own backyard. And this week, well, maybe we topped them all this time here. I don't know. I say that every week, but uh, this one's pretty big. We have uh, my friend uh, Mark Timig in here from eSports Entertainments, also known as eSports Network. Hey, Paul. Thanks for uh, bringing me in the studio. It's always great to be here with you. We've got an incredible 
subject to talk about today. Um, Esports. This is just the topic of the day here. I was telling somebody just the other day because. Full disclosure, uh, they're now in, uh, they're now syndicated on our uh, station as well, so that we run these eSports Minute, as you've been hearing, uh, throughout the day, and prompting people to ask me, show hosts, show guests, and show listeners, what the heck is eSports? And I'm like, have you been living under a rock? This thing is huge. Tell us what it is. Yeah, uh, that's a great comment, Paul, because they're, you know, not everybody is a gamer, and frankly, if you're you know, 45 and older, you may not be a gamer, but you... Abso- <laughs> why, are you why are you looking at me over your, <laughs> <Yeah>. that way? <laughs> well, but you absolutely know someone, whether it's a son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, My a grandchild. Son-in-law. My son-in-law. Yeah. Everybody knows somebody who is really excited about playing some type of online gaming, whether it's on their mobile phone or on their computer or on uh, a workstation uh, or, a, you know, a anywhere console yeah. there are all different ways in which people can engage with online gaming and it is a global phenomena this is not something just in our neighborhood or our country this is matter of fact in china there are more uh, esports gamers if you will than there is population in the entire united states but how do you take that the leap from people playing themselves participating in a game to watching others play the game? Well, that's a, that's a great question as well. Uh, you know, people really enjoy, and a good example is if you like to play, if you like to watch baseball, you might also like to play baseball. Yeah, that's true. So I think what people find that's when they... That's me in basketball. I was never very good at playing, but I sure love watching it. And, and it, it makes me appreciate it that much more because I know how difficult what they're doing is. <laughs> yeah, it all looks easy from the stands, yeah, doesn't it? Right. Uh, those three-point shots, yeah, I oh, can make that. Yeah. So I think you, you make an excellent point. People watch because both they're interested in the sport, but they also watch to get the tips and the tricks and how do these people actually do what they do. Yeah. And and whether we can perform at the same level or not, we're interested in learning those things. And I think, and we're amazed by those that can. Absolutely. Whether it's golf or football or yeah, basketball, right. any sport, including online sports. And I think the... But people have to... Well, I mentioned this too. Give me that quizzical look like, why would you watch somebody play a video game? And I say, why would you watch somebody shoot a basket? Why would you watch people hit a golf ball? And they kind of go, well, yeah, I guess, but that that's something in the physical realm, and I guess this is something in the online realm. But to, our, to my kids, there's no difference. Yeah, I think, you know, fantasy, if you will, and when we enter into a game, whether it's watching a, a game courtside or on television, you know, we're also entering into that game and seeing in our own imagination how we might we're be there. connected to that. We're exactly. there. I feel it. I'm shooting, and I'm shooting what he's shooting. I'm doing what he's doing or she's doing. Absolutely the case. And so one of the things that is really incredible about online gaming is there's a game for everyone. They're all different types of games that can be played. They're, they're nature games, they're um, shooting games, they're mystery games and fantasy games and World of Warcraft and hmm. League of Legends and all of these things. Because that was my, going to be my next question here. Is Have they decided on a set number of games? Is this only for World of Warcraft uh, uh, players? And I bring that one up very specifically because, folks, if you aren't aware of it, World of Warcraft, which is what, Blizzard here? Yes. Um, is, I believe, the largest online game in the world, or one of them. I don't know how many gazillion people participate in this game. On, you, you join in and play online with however many players are there sure. online. And they've been doing it for a while. I think they take, is it Angel Stadium or one of those places? And they literally have these giant rallies or get-togethers or demonstrations where people play games. Maybe it's even a competition. I don't know. Absolutely. Well, there's there's a League of Legends, which is now extremely popular. And there are many other variations of games that are coming out that people enjoy watching and participating. And yes, there are certain tournaments that can fill up entire venues, a stadium. And a stadium so on. of yes. people watching on big screens people play a video game yeah. and it's um, it's really uh, well spoken about in certain uh, reviews that have been done where you're playing with people that you 
you uh, are watching with people that you've built a community with. And one of the things that's uh, quite interesting is, of course, the U.S. military is actually uh, getting involved and providing gaming centers in a number of their bases, both domestically and internationally. Interesting. Uh, Because now you can have a young man or woman who joins the service, and maybe they're in Germany, and they can go online and play with their friends, their family members, other people, and stay connected. And they can make new relationships and meet new people. Ah. This is a well-known reason why people do enjoy it. It is also about very much about community. And I hate to say it, but Warfare of the Future is going to look more like a video game to, to people of my era than my father's in the trenches World War II kind of fighting. You know, for example, they fly drones, I believe, out of uh, North Dakota and shoot at bad guys over in the Middle East. Yeah, well, let's hope that there are fewer human beings involved <laughs> in some of this. And uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I want to take a brief minute and talk about is there, there are a lot of parents who are very concerned about their children playing games. I, I would think so. There, and, does it create more violence or, or, is, it, or is it too, too absorbing or too sedentary and all these things? Yeah, and I want to uh, I want to speak to some of those because when my kids were growing up and they got involved in gaming, I had some of those same concerns as a parent, mm-hmm. um, and I decided to, of course, get more interested and involved in exactly what my kids were doing, yeah. so that I could I could understand is this is this friend or foe, and I want to really try to attack some of the myths that as parents we I had and my wife had and others have had and still do that many of our gen- we're all of a certain generation here and we look at this askance we're not sure what it is like you said friend or foe yeah exactly and I think one of the things that's really important to think about for example let me take one of the very common myths uh, where people will say well kids are just sitting there in front of the screen for hours eating uh, junk food and drinking Drinking soft drinks right. and getting getting fat and not being outside and and uh, looking up the clouds and imagining the wilderness and so on. <laughs> and my first question uh, to parents, being you know, meaning no disrespect, but who buys the food in your home, your children <laughs> or you? Yeah. Wow. And if you're an adult and you're a parent, I'm a parent. I have a responsibility to buy the right food I want my children to eat. So no, my kids cannot get potato chips and ho-hos and soft drinks from (laughs) my cabinets because we don't buy that food. So one doesn't automatically go with the other. Absolutely. So I think blaming uh, poor eating habits or dietary habits or, or obesity on gaming is absolutely misdirected. But they are sedentary. And that was my parents' objection to the... I was the first TV generation that came about in the 50s here. And I spent a lot of time in front of that boob tube. And you know, a lot was written about what's that doing to my brain and what's that doing to my body. Here. Right. But, you know, when my kids were playing, they were snacking on grapes and apples and healthy food because my wife was very concerned about what are our kids going to grow up eating. And we didn't want kids who were uh, obese, you know, growing up, right. whether, whether they whether they participate Diabetic or and not. Obese exactly. Or, yeah, All yeah. of these situations. So gaming is not the the uh, that's not the reason for diabetes. Exactly. Right? It, it is. It's not the cause of it. The cause of it is how we live our lives. And as parents, what kind of example we lead with, and then what do we put in the cabinets for our children to have readily available? And so, rightly or wrongly, you know, like anything, like my parents eventually controlled the TV time. It, any of this stuff can be abused. You can watch television 24 days. You can what, play games 24 hours a day. You can lay on the couch 24 days. You can do anything you want to do. Um, and you have to, it's, it's part of a healthy, balanced lifestyle. But to also have this Luddite view that we can all go away and it's just we're going to blink our eyes and it's going to disappear is to ignore my grandson and all the others. My grandson's five and he loves video games and and we control how many and how often, but I can't control his enthusiasm for him. I can't keep him out of that world. Well, uh, I will also relate um, gaming to something else. I spent a number of years in charter school education. And oh, one yeah. of the cornerstones of, of what I had done in charter school education was to have built 
uh, uh, quite a number of at-risk dropout high schools that educated kids that the traditional system had uh, decided were uneducatable. Right, that's the strength of charter schools. Right? And um, in our particular model, we threw out the traditional model of, of educating kids because it doesn't work with dropouts, uh, and we brought in a computer-based, self-paced learning system, mm. which was incredibly effective. In fact, in you know, I graduated over 8,000 students while I was involved alone with full state-recognized diplomas, not GEDs. And Teaching this, to them the way that they want to relate it, to. Yeah. Their level, their pace, they were in control, and we were there as educators to support them, not to stand in front of them and direct them. And I think when you empower young people uh, who need to go at their own pace, and when they're dropout the students, oftentimes they have other issues or personal problems, and maybe even alcohol or drug addictions, and they may go away for two, three, four, five, seven days and then come back. In a normal classroom situation, you're done. You're out of it. But yeah. on a computer base, you just log back on and you're back in. Well, because that speaks to them. They are, they, are, uh, they are fluent in that language. I'm still a digital uh, uh, whatever, learner. They're a digital native. They yep. live in these platforms naturally. And I give an example again, my five-year-old uh, grandson. Um, I've watched him develop, and he started, obviously, introduced to video games through his friends, through his family, through everything. Uh, and whether we wanted to or not, he just was drawn to these things and plays them as often as we'll let him play them. And so I can say, gee, it's killing his brain cells or whatever. It's also building his brain cells. And I give you an example why. The other day, we're walking along a trail behind our house, and he comes to a big sign, and it says, he says, Grandpa, he says, why no dogs allowed here? And I look at him and I said, when did you learn to read? And he points at the sign. Of course, it's a symbol with the, the, the line through it. And I thought, where did he figure that out? Games. I, there's all sorts of things. I watched him the other day in a game, a new game I bought him. And he immediately, it, the question was, how, how old are you? And he doesn't know what it says, but he, he's intuitive enough to figure it out. And they're asking for my age here somewhere. And he sees a little dial, and he spins it. And it comes to the number five, and he hits it. I go, how did you figure that? And he says, I, I just know this stuff. I'm amazed at what they figure out from these things. Well, and, and uh, let's talk a little bit more about this computer-based learning, because yeah. that's what games do. It and, is, exactly. and I'm going to give you a couple of uh, points on that. One is that a, a lot of people recognize, uh, and you may or may not be familiar with this term, but it's called STEM skills. And these are skills that are well-respected in the education process. Is this the science, technology type of stuff that we're yes, talking about? Yes, it is. Right. And, and Education and uh, math, I forgot the E's for, but science, technology, something in math. It's, I tell you what, they're, they're the fundamental principles of many a person learning engineering, uh, engineering and, and, and all kinds yeah. of different jobs that involve science and, and math and so on. And I want to demonstrate really in a game how they use and develop and have to excel at STEM skills. So when you look at the STEM skills, they include things like um, collaboration, cooperation, mm -hmm. uh, analytics, you know, forecasting, and uh, uh, both really envisioning things, so imagination, and, and in, in terms of math and strategy, tactics, all of those things are, are very much a part of what is taught in a typical STEM uh, curriculum. And yeah, th in fact, this isn't uh, the, the games I grew up with, uh, Pong or whatever here, where you're just bouncing a ball back and forth. Or this is pretty sophisticated stuff, even at entry level. Uh, absolutely. So when you're playing, and you mentioned World of Warcraft example, I mean, you're dealing with strategy and tactics, and you're communicating with your teammates, and mm -hmm. you're, you're identifying um, where you think you have the best odds of succeeding, and you're you're um, you're predicting things and you're imagining things and all all of these things are all uh, exercising and developing your capabilities along those lines. Mm -hmm. So this idea that kids are doing something completely mindless and it has absolutely no value, 
is is uh, really not true at yeah, all. Yeah, look beyond the surface of the game. Okay, so they're chasing something or trying to collect something or shoot something or stop something. But look at what they're doing in the process. Look at what it's teaching them to do. Absolutely. And one of the other things I want to talk a little bit about is um, is the marketplace and what esports and, and from an investor standpoint, because there may be some investors uh, listening here, uh, is – We've we've spent a, a good year looking at the esports marketplace on a global scale mm -hmm. and a domestic scale here in the U.S. And we've decided where we want to play in this space. And yeah, let's decided, talk about that. Why you built this company? Yeah, what and, you guys do? And I want to also say there are some areas we don't want to be involved in because they they've actually been a pretty big economic black hole for people at this hmm. point. Okay. So. First, you know, talking about the areas that have been very economically challenged uh, initially include things like arenas. They're very expensive to build, mm -hmm. uh, very expensive to support, and are not u utilized enough to really make them economically sound investments. And you can fill them up for a day, but can you fill them up 30 days? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big problem. And, of course, they require a lot of sophisticated hardware, which, which of course, as we know in technology, things are moving so fast. Yeah, you could, you right. could put in hundreds of servers or, or computers to play games, and, and a year or 18 months later, there's something be far better. And if you're a competitive gamer, you don't want to be on yesterday's technology. No. You want to be on the latest. So, changes quickly. Yeah, yeah the, the change factor, the support, the stuff breaks down at times, needs maintenance, meet, needs support, gets viruses. It's just like a population of people in a way. So there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, team required uh, of people on your staff to, to be able to uh, host these things. And, and yet listening to the eSports Minute as they've been running here over the last uh, few weeks here on OC Talk Radio, I'm surprised at the deals that are being made around the world uh, uh, to build major arenas to host this sport. They think people will literally gather like they do at a football stadium and, and come and watch and participate and play. Well, I absolutely believe the arenas will have those um, those events and those activities. From an investment standpoint, That's not though, for you, though. Yeah, I right. just don't feel that the returns are going to be there and that the uh, it's an incredibly capital-intensive investment activity. I'll bet. Um, okay, so if it's not building arenas, what is it well, that you guys want to do? Well, it's also been very risky to back teams because there this is we're still early in, in some teams' development and only a few of the best teams in the the world are are really an economic and when you return. say a team i mean it's literally 10 12 kids or something it, I assume. It, yeah it's usually a half a dozen or so uh players on a team and uh, do they play any game the, every no, game or you, just some games you, usually they're they're specialized into particular areas they're doing league of legends or they're doing warcraft or other games specific right. Uh, and they'll travel around the country or the world to play these games and play in tournaments. And it's an expensive proposition to support a you know a team that's got to travel and do all these things. Right. So we've decided we're not. That's not for us at this point. Where we feel that there's um, real value and real um, contributions we can make. One is uh, we are are building out now uh, what will soon be an ESPN style full. Uh, all esports, all the time, broadcast network. Wow. And, this will uh, be over the Internet, I'm assuming? This will be all digital. So right. uh, everybody's cutting the cord here on the cable side and right. looking to digital. We'll have a, a very exciting platform that will be coming out uh, by the 1st of July uh, with a tremendous amount of capabilities, not only to get your news and to see things going uh, on, uh, but also to actually uh, participate mm -hmm. in uh, amateur tournaments that can have prizes of $10,000 wow. or more. Uh, and a, a place lot of for them things. to gather. A, 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 absolutely, and and a place for them to meet people that are like-minded and have similar interests. And to get updates on what's happening in the sport and information and absolutely. profiles and all the latest all of and that. greatest. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll actually be building a broadcast center as well, so we'll have a full studio operation. Being here in Irvine puts us right at the epicenter of what's going on in, in the uh, esports world. Well, that's why I was going to just bring it up. For those that don't know outside of Orange County, this is really one of the centers of the gaming industry, maybe because Blizzard's here and all the offshoots that came from them. But there's quite a number of gaming companies here. And for a while, there was hope that this would be also the uh, virtual reality the VR uh, center, because this is where that young kid Palmer Lucky invented the uh, uh, Oculus uh, Rift, the glasses that got bought by 
uh, Facebook, then they moved it up north. Uh, but there's still a lot of activity because of the basis of the big gaming companies. So this is a big part of the Orange County uh, business scene here, even if you don't know it. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Blizzard is just a few miles down the road. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, Red, who is one of the most famous camera companies in the world, right, uh, here. Is, is, is here. But we're also, we're no more than an hour away from, say, Riot Games and every major Hollywood studio in Los Angeles. Yeah, right. Hundreds of game developers. Uh, technology companies, Microsoft, uh, uh, Apple, everybody's got activities in this uh, Southern California area as well. So within an hour to an hour and 20 minutes, we've got San Diego, we've got L.A., and of course we've got Orange County here. So our ability to bring um, in some of the most interesting people to talk about, what, whether it's a new announcement they want to make, whether it's about um, updates to what they're currently doing, um, uh, whether it's anything and everything about esports they want to talk about or how it relates to esports, we're going to be inviting those people on our, Here at the uh, episode our shows yeah, right. and, uh, and we'll welcome them to uh, our platform to want to share whatever their announcements or conversations are. And what's the play? Is this just to attract an audience and sell ads, or are you going to have uh, other sorts of things that people can pay for, subscriptions, online services? What else do you get when you go to eSports? Well, anywhere? there will be, certainly we'll, we'll be working with companies that are interested in advertising on our network and, and uh, talking about their products and so on. There'll be product placement support. Uh, there will be sponsors of various shows and things we're doing. Will there, I see tournaments on there? Well, uh, well we will. We will be actually uh, uh, running um, amateur tournaments that'll be global. They're virtual. They're fully okay. brandable. So we'll be looking and speaking to, uh, looking for and speaking to sponsors who want to have their brand um, uh, in that. Uh, amateur tournament and uh, want to put up the prize money. But just and so as ESPN on. started small and then eventually got big enough to actually start bidding for the uh, broadcast rights to major NFL games, maybe someday you guys will actually have. I won't just go to an arena if the re if the event is taking place in Madrid, Spain or someplace else that I can't get to, maybe I watch it or participate through your network. Absolutely. We expect that within the next 18 months, we'll have over 200 reporters around the world oh, wow. uh, who are providing stories. And, and we'll, we'll Sort of like be, stringers or something, yeah, sending us stories? That, yeah, that's, that's a term often used in this, where we actually buy their content and have the exclusive rights to replay that content. Right. We're not going to get involved in paying their airline tickets or their entrance fees or, or their no, hotels. Nobody does that. We're going to we're going to uh, look for specific types of content, which they'll know because this will all be automated through our system, and we'll have uh, some editors on staff here in Irvine mm -hmm. uh, that will review the content material, and and uh, we will purchase that material from those esports reporters around the world. Uh, we'll actually eventually develop um, in uh, additional languages. So we'll have uh, oh Chinese, we'll have Korean, we'll have Spanish, uh, and potentially other languages um, so that we can uh, speak to those communities as well because they're very important communities in esports. Um, so we'll, we'll be uh, working, uh, as I say, uh, with, with reporters around the world, much like CNN works with reporters around the world. So is there no the other network like this? I don't think computing? that anybody else has, uh, has quite the plan that we do. We, we, certainly there are people who are providing uh, news and information about esports. We won't be exclusive in that regard. But I think our approach to it and our model for this is, is unique. The, the second thing we're going to be doing that I think is, is really extraordinary, um, and that is media training. One of the mm -hmm. one of the challenges for many young esports players is they've never been taught how to speak to the press. No, right. And you've got a lot of young people, and we have come up with a very simple formula, which is mastery of game plus mastery of media equals brand value. <laughs> and if you take yeah, a look, really, you're not just a good player. You you're a, you become a brand. You want to become a brand. Well, you want to become a brand. So if you take a look at just examples, simple examples, what did Tiger Woods do for professional golf? Uh, he alone is a personality who knew how to speak, who both had mastery of game, but also had mastery of media. And he, look, he just did it again. Yeah, um, amazing. He brought 
brought millions of viewers to professional golf that right. weren't weren't there until he came on. And people who suddenly wanted to play golf because of him, because particularly because he crossed certain barriers that we hadn't seen. You know, uh, other than old white guys like me, I hadn't seen too many people playing golf through the years, and he certainly opened up a lot of other barriers. Uh, and, and the same as yeah, the same has happened in tennis with Serena Williams yeah, and, right. and other tennis players, uh, and 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 even you look at kind of the fun, crazy uh, John McEnroe years ago. He was uh, people wanted to watch and and see what he was going to do next. Yeah, right. And we've got LeBron James and Michael Jordan. Look what Michael Jordan did for basketball, oh, for God's sake. Yeah. So when you look around at what can a, a well-spoken, well-trained uh, athlete do? Uh, to represent their sport, to build their own brand, and to bring people into and, this, uh, and to uh, and as a role model for others, as yeah. a role model, and to professionally represent brands. And I think what our intention is is uh, both to. Uh, so you want to develop stars out of these kids? You want to we do. We stars. we want to we want to develop uh, players, teams. We want to work with brands because if you're Geico and you're putting in three hundred thousand dollars behind a team or a tournament, we're, you want to hire us because you want to have a, a, a specific strategy on how are you going to maximize the investment you just made. Yes. How are you How are you going to ensure that when um, when that team you put money behind uh, goes out there, number one, they're, they're going to be saying and doing the right things and not embarrass your brand. And yeah. second of all, they're going to even remember to mention your brand right. as well. This takes preparation and training. Absolutely. So we believe that brands are going to get smart and recognize they need a media, uh, an esports media training company, not just a media training company, because the typical media training company is is a 45 plus uh, year old uh, person who's been on the air. Uh, they don't speak game, if you will. Um, <laughs> they, they got no game. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just they're just not designed yeah. to talk. They don't know uh, how to how to speak to a 21 year old uh, gamer uh, who has a completely different kind of approach and mentality. So you're looking to be all. It, there can be a lot of things. ESPN, that's a good analogy, a place where I go to read about it, hear about it, watch it. Esports Network with Esports. a Z. Just with a Z. It's E-S-P-O-R-T-Z Network. Yep. And is that up now? Is that something? Uh, it is. As a matter of fact, we also have a uh, a great podcast channel. Podcasting, of course, is becoming very popular. Absolutely. So uh, we have eSports, uh, again, uh, we, we actually, uh, with a Z and an S, when it uh, eSports Network Podcast. Uh, and we're also um, a skill set on Amazon Alexa. So if you download our um, uh, eSports Minute, oh, my uh, Alexa is going to speak now. I have one in the studio. Yeah, I don't want to uh, do that. <laughs> you can you can uh, you can get that eSports Minute there as well. And we were the first in the world to do that. Um, and I think eventually, and I, I really admire Paul here uh, because he's the first radio station in the country uh, to be broadcasting an eSports Minute. Happy to do it. It, it fit our concept it, because, one, we want to be on the cutting edge. Two, we want to support what's happening here in the business community. And three, we think it's a tremendous opportunity to reach a whole new audience uh, for for your sport and for our for our audience of well, of I absolutely shows. agree with that. And and if people would like to learn more about what we're doing, I would encourage you to uh, to go to esports e s p o r t z network dot com. So it's esports network dot com, and you'll also find a link to um, a really great campaign that we have at Start Engine today. So go on to esports network dot com. Get uh, get acquainted. Uh, check. Out our new campaign on Start Engine. I'd love to come back, Paul, and talk more. There's so much more to talk we about. We only scratch the surface. So let's do that. Let's have you as, as 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 announcements come forward as you as you roll this out and as you get us closer to a studio, as you get closer to some bigger announcements, come back and we'll share them with our audience here. And for those who want to stay connected, keep listening here. We're going to be playing this eSports Minute throughout the day, uh, each and every day here on Orange County's only community radio station. So Mark Timmig, eSports Entertainment, also known as eSports Network, thanks for coming by. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. You've been listening to another example of OC Spotlight. Spotlighting the incredible things happening right here in our own community, right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net.
Welcome in to another episode of the Esports Minute presented by Esports Network. I'm Mitch Rames. Today's top story is a massive investment in a new esports hub. The Chinese island of Hainan is the southernmost point in the country and just received an investment of 1 billion yuan. That translates to just over 150 million dollars. The money is going into an esports development fund that will build infrastructure to hold esports events, change tax rates on the islands for esports related businesses, and bring in international visas for esports players from around the world. The money is an allotment from the Chinese government and from Tencent, one of the world's leading esports companies. These plans were unveiled by Sun Yin, the director of Hainan Tourism, Culture, Radio, Film, and Sports in a speech on June 24th. Quote, Developing an esports industry in Hainan is an important step to reinforce Hainan as a major position and a destination point of international tourism. The Hainan Esports Harbor will combine esports and tourism to build a new tourism plus esports consumption model. End quote. This development is another major step for Chinese increased focus on dominating the esports sector worldwide. That's all for this Esports Minute. Be sure to check back tomorrow for the biggest esports story of the day in just 90 seconds. You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We are going to have a rollicking good time today with my friend Eric Spitz. Now, Eric, Eric comes from one of my favorite cities after L.A., from Boston, and, and in fact, uh, Eric, I got to got to tell you that uh, my only subscription to newspaper is is the Boston Globe. That is my favorite go-to newspaper. So Eric traveled all the way across the country after after being uh, very much involved in the Narragansett beer in in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, came out and for a while was in newspapers in uh, Southern California, especially in Orange County with the Register. And now he's on to a whole new adventure that we want to hear about. So Eric, welcome to the Pilgrim on the 405. Well, thank you for having me, Will. So so uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about post-Register life for you. I've been a lifelong entrepreneur. The Register was one of the chapters in my life that showed some entrepreneurial expertise, experience, uh, know-how, and uh, we got into an operating business that was very difficult to sustain as a business. Uh, Just look at the rest of the industry. We thought we had some insights. Some of them were correct. Some of them proved harder than we had imagined. Yes, yes. Okay, so that's all the past. It's all back there. So... Tell us about the path from then to here. Well, it's interesting uh, how you ask the question because as the register was uh, winding down as an opportunity for me, I started to look at some other uh, industries where I could leverage my experience and my skill set. And 